So such a conference is a really unknown territory for me. So after some hesitations, I decided to present here an area of category theory whose, uh, say, importance is steadily growing, I mean, accessible categories. I would like to give you a taste of what's going about, yes? So, uh, I don't want to scare you with definition because then it will be just illustrated by examples, but the definition should be here. So, an accessible category, in fact, you have some cardinal number here. So, this theory, in fact, happily lives in set theory. And uh, better in Gettle Ben, I said theory because we need also large collections. Uh, don't think about this too much, what are lambda-value collimates and what are lambda percent objects that I will explain very soon. So, at first, this definition. But I will explain it on examples. So, this definition, and uh, I think the best thing is to elegant terminology, accessible means lambda accessible for some lambda. And the best thing is to look at examples. So, for instance, the basic example is the category of sets and mappings. So, anybody knows that any set is a directed union of finite subsets. What does it mean directed? It means that you have finitely many finite subsets, so then union is again finite, which means directed. So, you see here this uh, second condition. Any set is a lambda directed collimit, this is this union, of a lambda presentable object. This lambda is aleph zero here, so it will be mean finite. So, I should tell what does it mean is finitely presentable. So, again, just imagine that you have a chain and take union of a chain and take finite subset in the union. Then everybody knows there is finite subset is a subset of some element of the chain. Because any element of finite subset belongs to some member of the union, so we have finitely many members. It's directed, so we have something which is above. And in fact, this is the idea of finite presentability. Because uh, that's category formulation, because here you, that's my chain here. Yes, it could be arbitrary chain, but I can make it just countable here. So this is this union. So now I have finite set, and I include it to the union. So then it factorizes to something, it's a subset of something. This is exactly what this abstract formulation means. So you can forget about these fancy, fancy definitions and just look at examples. The same is with partially ordered sets. Absolutely same situation. Uh, again, those finitely present tables are finite partially ordered sets. And this is the same kind of argument. Again, any post set is that you know, finite sub post sets and absolutely the same situation. And the same situation if it's groups, but now I cannot say finite group, I should say finitely presentable group, which means group given by finitely many generators, finitely many relations. And then exactly finitely presentable means the same thing. This categorical definition means the same thing as this group definition to be finitely presentable. And this replaces here this finiteness because you have group relations, so simply you have to somehow make multiplication of generators and so on. So you have here three typical categories which are finitely, which is LF0 accessible. This cardinal is LF0 here. Because the lambda directed means that any, this is partially set, that any subsets having less than element, less than lambda elements has an upper bound. This is what I used with finitely directly process and find the present table things. Another example to illustrate are complete metric spaces where I for morphism take contractions. So which don't increase distance. So now this find the presentability sound doesn't work because you can have a sequence Going to a point, 
and you take just those subspaces to make their union, but since it should be complete, so you have to add this extra point here. So now, for instance, just a single point is not finally presentable because you can go to this edit thing and doesn't factorize back. If you want to achieve this, you have to come to RF1 directed things. So you need that any countable subset has an upper bound. And then since sequences are countable, so any such sequence in the union, in fact, is a sequence in some member of the union and has a, uh, and has a limit there. So everything works as before. But you should go from RF0 to RF1 to catch these constructions, limits of sequences. So this category is RF1 presentable. And RF1 presentable objects here are not countable spaces, but countably generated spaces, which means having countable dense set. Because all is determined by this dense set, the dense subset, you have just then limit of sequences from it. So the separable spaces, having countable dense subset, are those RF1 presentable objects. And the same situation. Another example of the same kind are Banach spaces and linear contractions, absolutely the same thing. And again, those are one possible objects are separable Banach spaces. With Hilbert spaces, this is even maybe more transparent because then you take separable Hilbert spaces again. So in fact, it's a Hilbert spaces having countable orthonormal base. So again, these categories are RF1 accessible. Because in all cases, you have this countable construction of having a limit of a sequence. So now I give you another example of that kind, uh, just because this appears in, in physics, these are causal sets, which are both sets, which are locally finite which means that between two points, there are only finitely many members, elements, and uh, any, there's not, it's past finite, which means that below a point, there's only finitely many, many things. So these causal sets are, were proposed as a model for discrete space-time in quantum gravity. And again, by the same argument, in fact, this category of causal sets is all accessible. Because again, you have to catch this infinity. Because having infinitely many, say, if below some point, infinitely many things, so since I have one directed, so you should have infinitely many things in some member of this chain, which is not possible. A typical example, I, we take negative integers. And now we take just such directed union. So, of course, any of these finite members is fine, it's causal, but do not this union, it's not causal. But if this chain would be longer, so then everything should be restored in this upper bound because it's causal, so you cannot have a descending chain here. So this is the same thing as this, as this sequences. So another manifestation how these categories appear. So these are just examples. I will also give you non-examples later. But now, oh, that's good. the marker yes. is very hard to read from. Ah, good, good. So, mm -hmm. having any first-order theory and taking category of models with elementary embeddings, that's important, as elementary embeddings as morphism, so those preserving all formulas. So then this category is accessible. Uh, I think is that somewhat a directed union or now one has to be careful with direct because it could be really uh, also, no, but, no, sorry. Directed union of elementary embeddings and elementary embeddings. So that's not a problem. But what are these uh, small objects which generate? It depends on theory. And in fact, it's a Lemmy's column theorem which does it. 
and which means that at some moment you have elementary submodel generated by that. So in general, this category is accessible. It depends on the theory. Uh, what's this cardinal doing that? And also I take here elementary embeddings. In lucky cases like groups and sets and post sets, you can take all of morphisms, all homomorphisms. But in general, you have to take elementary embeddings. And the same holds also for infinity logic. This L kappa kappa means this is logic where you allow, well, maybe I should take here two cardinals, kappa lambda, but uh, at the moment it's not important. So this first cardinal, this first kappa means that you have these junctions or conjunctions over less than kappa formulas. The second kappa means that you can quantify over less than kappa variables. So this is the logic. And again, you take elementary beddings, which are kappa elementary in this case, and you get the same thing, this category accessible. And in fact, all accessible categories appear in this way. So accessible categories, in fact, are categories of models of infinity logic. Yes, I should tell you that this theory was created in late 80s by Maca and Pare, but all those gems were in early 70s, Gabriel Ulmer, and even in late 60s in the work of Grotto. So, but really, this theory was somewhat created late 80s. Exactly as something which should correspond to, to infinite logic. Yeah, so this is how you can get them. So now I want to give you a kind of a idea how you can use this. So now it will go a little bit to, to model theory in some sense. So this is an easy observation that in Excel, in Excel category, any object is presentable for some lambda. Again, I will give you intuition in a moment about that. The presentable means that the lambda presentable for some lambda. So now, this will be non example. So we take CPOs. Somebody mentioned that yesterday. So these are, in fact, chain complete post sets, so post sets where every chain has a join. And the morphisms are mapping preserving joints of chains. So these post sets are important in certain computer science, in denotational semantics, domain theory. And this is a category which is not accessible. So why? So again, this is the very similar situation like with metric spaces, but now those chains here are arbitrary long. So this problem that you take a union, you create a chain, and you have to add its join. So you get extra elements. So a piece and a piece, you cannot catch it by any cardinal. Because always you can take such a long chain and get a new point here, which means that singleton is not lambda presentable for that because it doesn't factorize a new point. So nothing is because you can always go here. So you see, but of course here, it doesn't contradict what I told you because in fact, this is not category of models or with the logic because maybe I should t tell you this because this with the logic, what does it mean? You have a set of symbols and then you have some formulas and so on, but we have a set of operation relations. While here you have a proper class of operations because to any chain, to any length of chain, you have this join. So it goes beyond first order logic because you have a proper class of symbols. So in some sense, accessible categories are categories which are given by a set of data. Right? This is given by a class of data, in fact. So it goes beyond. It's a nice thing, but it's not accessible. Another example, a little bit funny, but I will use it later, is that you take a large discrete category. So what's a large discrete category? You have a proper class of objects, and the only morphisms are identities. 
So no morphisms if you identity. So it's got a discrete category. So uh, this category, in fact, has directed colimates. Why? Because you cannot organize any directed diagram here. So it has directed colimates because there are none. No diagrams to, to disprove that. And any object is finally presentable. Again, there's nothing to check. But it's not true that anything is a very colimit of, fine, of, of, say, of a set of those things, because you don't have a colimit here. So again, it's a typical bad category, which is, which is, not, which is not, not accessible. So the slogan is that these are categories which are small generated in the sense. So in non-technical terms, these are large categories that, that could also small, but it's not so interesting. So large categories which are just more generated. So you see here, this, how the tension between large and small is important, yes. In fact, the categories in some sense complicates life because you have to deal with large collections because you want to have large categories. And there are different ways how to cope with that. So what I really prefer is to stay in set theory. So you get a better set theory where small means sets and large means a class. So now I give you a, somewhat, a little bit taste what can you do with this. Uh, so this will be a, a glimpse to, to model theory. So any object is presentable for some lambda, and you can take the smallest lambda, say this present table. And this is called presentability rank of this object. And if this presentability rank is a successor, it means next cardinal to something. So this something is called the size of an object. So for instance, uh, if you have a set, but infinite set, so its size, its cardinality. You see, the point is that also these accessible categories, usually, if they appear, so they appear as concrete categories. It means as categories with underlying sets, categories equipped with a faithful functor to sets. Just this is a presentation, like group, both sets, and so on. But in general, I want to take them as an abstract categories because sometimes the same category can be presented in different ways by different language, by different underlying sets and so on. So it has advantage to take it abstract. And the point is here that this important invariant, which is the cardinality of subset of the underlying set, in fact, can be taken categorically without underlying sets. So just by the size defined in this way. As the the smallest cardinal is lambda presentable and if it's successor. And it exactly works because not for finite sets, because in some sense uh, that's too, too near. But if you have countable set, so its presentation rank is Aleph 1, so its size is Aleph 0. And the same with both sets. The same with groups, but I have to take uncountable groups because I can finally generate it, things can be countable. So again, that's too low, so I have to start sufficiently high, which means uncountable here. Which means that at some moment, it is eventually, those sizes I have here coincide with cardinalities. You see, now this is a little bit technical, but maybe that's some, some general meaning how to achieve this invariant without underlying sets, so it means not depending on presentation, not depending on language where you, where you give it. And just now I repeat that, but this is important in fact, because you have this, uh, again, infinite polymetric space, so it's, it's size, it's not the cardinal, I think, but it's density character, because this decides, the, say, the cardinal dense set. So this is the smallest candidate of dense subset, density character. And in fact, if you look at continuous logic, so people play with this density character in place of cardinal underlying set, and just explanation is that the main, this is the same thing if you do it like a presentability. 
And the same is for infinite dimensional Banach spaces. And even for Hilbert spaces, that's uh, somewhat very, very natural. So it's the carnet of its orthogonal base. So this is the right size. Not the cardinality of the space, but the cardinality of ordinal base. So this is, this is size in this abstract meaning. And just comment, this is a quite recent result, most by set theorists, that uh, an infinite dimensional Banach space has cardinality lambda to LF zero. Which means that you cannot have any, I do it for Hilbert spaces, Hilbert space in a current of counter local finality. Because if lambda has counter local finality, so lambda lambda left zero is, is bigger. So which means uh, that uh, that's not true that there are Hilbert spaces of all cardinalities. This cardinality should, couldn't have counter local finality. But of course, there are Hilbert spaces of any size, because you can take anything as a base. So now it starts to behave differently, and this some of the categorical things, in fact, behave more smoothly than this standard, this cardinality, because it forces you to go to basis. So, but in many situations, this coincides, these two things. So if you, I take first of the theory, uh, even infinitary, so then at some moment, which is eventually those sizes i talking about coincide with cardinalities. So in fact, that's no, no difference. These cardinalities are in fact definable without this concrete presentation just that depend just on your, your category. Oh, so now I did something wrong. Yes. Good, so that this, sorry, this first of the theory was finitary, but even it's true if the set theory is of L kappa omega, which means, now these are different cardinals, which means that conjunction disjunctions are infinite, but quantification is finite. So if the quantification is finite, so still this coincides at some moment, from some moment. But Hilbert spaces, Hilbert spaces can be also axiomatized in infinite logic, but not with finite quantification. And now you see that it never starts to go inside, as, as I explained to you. So whenever you go beyond finite quantification, so things start to be wilder. Although these examples are very important, of course, Hilbert space, Banach space, but if you want to do model theory for this, so then it's really better to do with sizes and not with cardinalities. So that's even more general step. You see Shellach, who somewhat was leading this research in generalized model theory, introduced abstract elementary classes. So in some sense, the abstract elementary class means that you have still you have some signature, you have some language. So you have to take some models. But you don't choose these models by some theory, but just, just you take something and you take some properties of these things which are chosen. Also, you don't choose your morphisms by theory, like you can have all homomorphisms, elementary beddings, and so on. But again, you choose it by abstractly. And you have some of these abstract choices which leads to an abstract elementary class. So in some sense, these abstract elementary classes generalize those theories given by finite quantification. And again, for them, uh, sizes are eventually the same thing as cardinalities. And these abstract elementary classes are accessible categories. So that's, in fact, another example how accessible categories appear. And now, just to tell you that there are things which are open is that it's not known. You see, for instance, in those Banach-Hilbert spaces, you can create, or you have, 
arbitrary large gaps in existence of model. Because there are arbitrage cardinals, so there is no model of that cardinality, because just you take control of finality. It doesn't happen with sizes, but still, that's a question whether it's general or not. So whether you can have actual categories of the large gaps of sizes. Uh, there are many conditions where it cannot happen, but that in general it's, it's open. So in some sense, it's a typical problem which, which appears here, whether you can do such repeating irregularity forever by finite set of data in some sense, yes? So this is related to this another question. So now I could ask you, so this large discrete category, could you fully embed it in a local dependable category, uh, in accessible category? So what does it mean? For instance, if I have a just single object, yes? and only identity, so just I can take just this graph because there are no endomorphisms here, only identity. If I want to do these two objects, so just I name this relation as zero, I take other relation with one, and again, there's nothing between this. And I can do it for any finite, for any set, because I have a set of relations at my disposition. But now I would like to have a proper class, so I would like to code such large discrete category by a set of things. So now I could ask you what, you what you expect that it's somewhat right, whether it's true or not true. So probably the intuition is that it shouldn't be possible. And this is called Wopienka's principle, that it's not possible. But surprisingly, this Wopienka principle is very large cardinal axiom. It implies the existence of a proper class of large cardinals, inaccessible, measurable, even strongly compact, and so on and so on. So you see, in some sense, this thing, which looks very plausible, creates a lot of bad animals, I mean large cardinals. Now, of course, on one hand, this open comes is equivalent with the fact that any full subcategory of an example category is more generated, it means satisfies this condition too. Yes, so the largest categories, whenever this cannot be fully embedded, so then anything what's the largest the category is more generated. It doesn't need to have vertical coordinates, but it's more generated. For some kappa, you don't know which one, this is just given by this principle, you don't know which one. And also, one can in fact speculate, now this is some sense, I don't want to say philosophy, but general question what's, what's, what's correct. So on one side, these large cardinals eliminate pathologies because somewhat anything which is included in the category is somewhat nice. There are many more results of that kind, yes? I, I don't want to go to that, yes? And also, on the other hand, you see, it's a question whether a large cardinal is pathological or not, because, for instance, take measurable cardinal. It means that uh, that's a countably complete ultra filter, which is not principal. So, which means it's not generated by a point. So, if you know that that's no measurable cardinal, so for any ultra filter, you get a point which generates that, which is, in fact, construction tool. So, this non-existence, gives you tools to construct such strange things like large discrete category embedded to an accessible category. Yes, yeah, so he, one can speculate here, but anyway, this tension between large and small somewhat provokes entering of large cardinals to the game, yes. Well, maybe you cannot like it. Some category theorists told that when your question depends on set theory, so it's a bad question. In some sense, it might be true, but you don't know in advance whether it's good or bad. So, simply, that's, that's the situation. Good, so, now in the last uh, eight minutes of my talk, I would like to tell you another typical thing which appears in accessible categories. In some sense, this is a right framework for a 
general abstract theory of injectivity. So here I create an issue, what does it mean that an object is injective to a morphism? This is a, a well-known definition probably, yes. It means that for any morphism H, sorry, for any morphism F here, you have an extension to this. Anybody who somewhat did module theory so knows how injective modules, for instance. So this is injectivity. And you can view this injectivity also in some sense model theoretically because it tells you that for every F, it can be coded, there exists something. And having some now class of morphisms and taking objects is injective to any member of that class, so I call it injectivity class, inch S. This is that which considers those objects. But if it is a class, so then my theory, because for any H I have some formula, so then if it is class, so in fact I have two big theory having a class of things. So uh, I would like to have small theory, which means I would like to have only set of members of this S. And this is important because this is well known that for modules, you take injective modules, which are injective to, to, to embeddings of submodules, and you don't need to check all submodules, that's too many of them, but it's enough to check just embedding of an ideal to the basic base ring. This is called Bare Criterion. So in fact, this is now small injectivity class. And in this case, on the other hand, if you do it in pressure sets with embeddings, so then those injectives are complete lattices. If you do it in Banach spaces, so these injectives are Banach spaces of continuous functions over extremely discordant common Hasbro space. And now the the result is that whenever you have only a set of those things, which means you have a small theory, and in fact, all this is accessible of the object. So coming back, injective modules are always accessible, but uh, not uh, complete lattices. This is the same situation as with uh, CPO. Simply, you have too many, too many joints. So this is not an accessible category. Also, these Banach spaces, this not accessible category again. So, which means that the corresponding embeddings cannot be small generated in the sense that it suffices that you have some kind of bare criterion, that it suffices to do it only for a set of things. So, again, you see here this tension between small and large, which manifests here. So, this is, in fact, what I, what I told you. And in Banach spaces, it, it's not more generated. So, and this accessibility, in fact, is a measure. You see, because that was open, in fact, for some moment. So, how to recognize that something is not more generated? But you here, you have a criterion. Just look at the objectives. So, if they're accessible, so it's more generated. And in fact, this is basically corresponding to that. So. Uh, another thing which you would like to, to do, for instance, with modules, is to embed any module to, a, to an injective module. To embed any module to an injective module. There are various ways how to do it, but somewhat canonical approach which is, say, maybe not in module three books, is this one, small bit argument, which tells you that whenever you have S class, which is in export generated, so in fact it could be a set, and you are in accessible category. I, now I want to have call limits because I need call limits to run this argument. So then it's true. Any morphism has an S morphisms in modules embedding to S injective module, so which means that we have enough injectives. I explain you how this argument is working, but it appeared in homotopy theory. 
We call it homotopy theory. So if you want someone to identify homotopical continuous maps, so then the, there's general machinery for doing this, which is full of injectivity. And in some sense, you need that those injectivities appear there, have enough injectives. So this was called small object argument. And how do you proceed? So simply, you test your module to injectivity. But you don't inspect whether it's, this solution exists or not. Simply, you add new solution. So which means, and you can do it, for instance, by taking push out or something. So you get M1. And you take another such. And again, you take it here, and you extend it, and so on. And you do it. There's only a set, so at some moment it stops, which means that all things living in M have solution in M star. But it's not the end, because you could have also some things living in M star, and you have to do it. So you have to iterate the star construction. And if it stops, you are done. But why it stops? If you go sufficiently long, so then any such thing, in fact, because this is small, somewhat lives back and has solution before, so it stops. So just this accessibility and this smallness of these objects there, presentability, uh, makes this, this construction to converge. So this is called small object argument. So as I told it's original homotopy theory and has many applications algebra models here in topology. So just maybe last minute. So in model theory, you speak to injectives with respect to lambda presentable objects. And these injectives are called lambda saturated objects. And it has, in fact, usual meaning if you take category of models of some theory. And objects which are saturated of size Lambda sort of size lambda are called saturated. And uh, they are related to Fresnel limits. Probably next talk will mention something of that. And in fact, those saturated objects concentrate all properties of finite dependent objects or finite objects, just in a single countable object. Uh, so you see, so I gave you, in fact, three, three examples for this injectivity. So one was injective modules. This is something which is taught in at algebra course. Then the next thing is just, I told you that it's homotopy theory. A typical example of injectivity are Kahn complexes, which are injective to, to anodyne extensions. And then also in, in model theory. So you see this accessible category somewhat appear in many totally different areas of mathematics. And also coming back to those causal sets, so the Roste constructive causal sets. Saturated of size LF0, so, so it also works in this situation. So thank you, that's all.